Hello. Ah, it is working. Good. My name is Lynn Geisinger. I'm the moderator. This panel is Business and Ethics in Sport. It's panel number 2612. And we have a great panel today. Bef yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good. All right, Bef go home, Dad. <laughs> Before I introduce our panel, I'm gonna, gonna explain we're kind of a trial um, system here in the Central Ballroom where we'll be taking questions by text and by three by five note card. Maybe you've seen this before. But the panel, the, the questions from the audience, both you and the people watching us while it's live streaming, um, should come in by text or if you'd like, you can wave your hand. Here's some three by five note cards. I think my producers We'll, okay, if you want, here's some pencils too. If you want to use a 355 note card, wave your hand. Um, to participate in giving a text question, you have to join the session. So even if you think you might ask a question, you should join the session. And to do that, you want to text, you send a text message to this five digit number that's posted 22233. Two, two, three, three, and the message of your text should that's be. Four. Capital U M C G M B. You'll get a con confirmation message that you're now part of the session, and you can reply to that message to ask your question. There have been apparently some technology challenges, so if that happens, we'll go back to another system. If you're a student, please write, write I am a student, because as always, we try to give students priority to ask the first questions. If you would like your first name and your location to be read aloud, you can include that in your text as well. If you don't have a cell phone or, or would like to do it a different way, wave your, wave your hands for a three by five index card. And uh, finally, please text the word leave when you leave the room to close out your session. I'll repeat these instructions after we get through our, our panelists. And our panelists today, uh, next to me is Adam Schrager. And Adam is, uh, is a former Colorado uh, journalist and uh, now heads the investigative reporter team at a TV station in, in Wisconsin. Um, I discovered in looking through, I took a few minutes to look at his book about how uh, Colorado turned the legislature democratic. It looks fascinating. Uh, but he also has done a lot in the sports world. Uh, next to him is Bill Martin. And um, I knew when I read his um, intro that Bill was, uh, excuse me, I wanted to read, that uh, uh, he's been the uh, athletic director for 10 years at University of Michigan and then he was president of the USOC and I wrote a friend of mine who had worked for the athletes with the USOC and he said, Bill will be great for that topic. Too many people are in sport for their own gratification but Bill was one who seemed to have the athlete's best interest at heart, so I thought that was worth sharing. Who was that? <laughs> <laughs> where, where do I send the check? That's right. <laughs> Next to him is Joe Sexton, and uh, after 25 years wearing different hats at the New York Times, including as sports editor, Joe is now a senior editor with ProPublica, the investigative journalism um, outfit. And finally, we have Ismail Efrain, and uh, if I said that right, uh, who is um, one of 12 professional um, referees working with FIFA and, and the MLS, and he lives in Austin, Texas. So e and asking each of them to speak for a few minutes, I think Joe offered to go first. After, if they might speak for, for 10 minutes, they may speak less. And then they can ask questions or talk among themselves a little bit, and then we're going to try to get right to the questions. Great. Uh, good afternoon. The, uh, I've just served on the police shootings panel or whatever, and I, <laughs> I have a very angry handwritten note to me from that. So hopefully I'll go over better here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Read the note. Uh, the, uh, anyway, I, I actually, you, you know, because I'm... Uh, an inveterate egotist, um, you know, I, I, I could conceive this panel as my own, uh, the prosecution of Joe Sexton, because uh, if anybody is culpable for failing to actually adequately address, uh, you know, some of the ethical uh, shortcomings in sports, um, I would be, you know, uh, at the front of the list of prime suspects. Um, the uh, but one of the great things about sports and its 
ethical problems is it's just a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, it's better than any, you know, they, in Albany in New York, right, there's a cesspool of corruption and you can't believe when they've indicted every senior official in Albany over the last couple of years. You think like, uh, yeah, you know, there can't be more and yet there is. And so in the weeks leading up to this uh, uh, conference, you know, it was like somebody had, you know, reached in and said, I'm going to help your panel out a little bit. <laughs> Because in the last couple of weeks, right, we've had the New York Times expose uh, the NFL for in one of its first uh, inquiries into the menace of head injuries and concussions, um, having, you know, missed at least 100 uh, concussions in their initial survey because none of the teams were mandated to do it and then having spent subsequent years lying about it. So that's a pretty good one, and that might have been enough for this panel, but no. Uh, <laughs> the NHL actually was forced under threat of lawsuit to uh, pony up some uh, email conversations among their senior leaders on the question of head injuries and their, and the, their threat, their true threat, and whether the, the, the fighters that the league had sanctioned and celebrated um, in a grotesquerie of many decades uh, might actually increase the risk of head injuries and, and, and the terrible and often tragic outcomes of them. Oh, well, yeah, they lied again. They lied about that. In fact, they were aware of it. They knew of it. They recognized it, and they hid it, and they lied about it. So that might have been good enough, too. Um, but then I was having breakfast this morning, and I was like, what the fuck is up with this? Panama Papers, or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, oh, it's about all this offshore stuff, and the, the <laughs> Prime Minister of Iceland resigned today, or whatever. It's, it's probably a tragedy the world will recover from. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> the, uh, but then, you know, so they've now disclosed where everybody was hiding all their money to avoid taxes and whatever, and oh my God, a FIFA official is caught up in it. <laughs> Uh, if the FIFA hey, hey. fiasco uh, yeah, wasn't there. bad enough. The, uh, oh, I haven't, uh, wait till I get started with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's so close. <laughs> the, uh, anyway, so it's just the gift that keeps giving, right? If you, if you, if you want to worry about whether sports has some ethical issues, you know, give yourself five minutes. Um, so, you know, part of the challenge is how do you actually kind of break through um, that generally accepted cynicism. Um, you know, we're so well conditioned mm -hmm. uh, to think so little uh, of our athletic institutions and our athletes themselves. Um, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, meaningfully get through to have a true conversation about it and the future of sports? Um, and you know, I lost my mom back uh, just about a year ago, whatever, but I'm gonna make her happy because I actually think the women in this room are the answer, specifically when it comes to uh, allowing their children uh, to play in games, uh, sports uh, that present real uh, long-term risk. I don't think ill of dads. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I was one myself, I am one. Um, although one of my great blessings in life is that I, I apparently only sire women, so I have four daughters. <laughs> um, so that's my gift to the world, and they can help figure out sports and ethics as they grow up. But I really do think, you know, uh, when you take a look at something like the National Football League and the college football that underlies that and the high school football that underlies that and the peewee football that underlies that, um, even for somebody who loves sports dearly, Who's a who loves its competition uh, and its storytelling uh, and its uh, capacity for surprise? Whether that's a a sequence of six seconds that decided the basketball championship last night, um, you know, I, I I love it to death. I've loved it since I was a kid. I loved it when I was a sports writer. I loved it when I was a sports editor, but. You know, there's some tough things to confront. Um, and when you just look at the, at the annual human toll of an NFL season, I, I mean, it's just, I, 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 among the many things I'm not as a, as a good student of history or whatever, but I've seen a couple of movies and that's probably enough. Um, 
But it is like some, you know, some Roman gladiator insanity. I mean, you know, their knees are being shredded, their heads are being blown up. They're it's a sport that is just too violent to, um, well, I, I, I don't have a arrived at position, but I, I would invite the people here to think, is it a sport that you can actually condone uh, anymore? Is it a sport that you can actually encourage your son or your daughter um, to get into? Um, is it a sport that you can use your uh, public taxpayer dollars to underwrite the next stadium for? Is it a sport that you can order your you know, 7,000 chicken wings uh, on Sunday afternoon and sit in front of it and watch it? Um, God, it, it's great, you know? I, I love it, but it's killing people. And the, the carnage is, uh, you know, it's, it's, if you stopped and just, and I tried to pull it together and ran out of time, but the true compendium of just a single season National Football League injury report. You know, I it's hard to feel about it anything other than this is madness. Um, and when I, so, I, uh, you know, when I speak to, you know, or encourage moms um, to be the, the pioneers of our, uh, of our reform, um, one, of the, one of my most satisfying uh, experiences as sports editor at the Times. We did a, a series, uh, a three-part series that John Branch, who's a wonderful reporter and a beautiful writer, um, did on the, the life and death of a, of a hockey enforcer. That's what they call him. And one does have to be worried about a sport that has a designation called enforcer. <laughs> um, and it was a kid, Derek Bugard, uh, who had grown up in Western Canada. Um, and who, you know, loved hockey the way all Canadian boys do, um, and who got on skates at age two and dreamed of playing in the NHL, and um, he wasn't very good. Uh, I mean, pretty good by, you know, American standards, um, but he wasn't going to make it in the NHL as a goalie or a defenseman or a star s winger. He didn't have the talent. But he's, he still actually had a way to get to the NHL, and that was to punch his way to the NHL. Uh, and, you know, and he did. And he punched his way uh, onto the Minnesota Wild. He punched his way onto the um, New York Rangers. And he punched his way into a certain kind of celebrity as the most feared fighter in the NHL. Again. What? It's a hockey game. The most feared fighter. Um, and then he, you know, we, it, we titled the series Punched Out because that's what he did. He got punched out. Um, died in a drug overdose fueled by depression, fueled by a series of undiagnosed and then properly diagnosed but no maltreated concussions. And the, the moment that, you know, um, stays with me is um, he's maybe 15. He's playing in junior hockey in, in Western Canada. And he's on the bench and his friends and his, his, uh, his uh, kids in his age group are there. And one after another, they're being sent onto the ice to play. Um, and he's not, you know, in hockey, behind the bench, they often just tug your jersey when it, it's your time to be next over the boards and onto the ice. And no one tugged at his jersey. And He turns to the coach after the game, he says, you know, you know I, I, why am I not, I can play. You know, just look at me. I'm right here in front of you. And the coach, I had no trouble seeing him. The coach knew what use he would be. But it wasn't going to be playing. And if somebody had had, you know, the honesty there, including his own parents, 
will blame themselves in part to this day to say, hey, Derek, you're a great kid. You're not going to play in the NHL. There's a million things you could do with your life and preserve your brain. And he asked for it. He said, look at me, coach. I'm right in front of you. He was. And they said, you'll be a fighter. Disgraceful and hard to accept. So, you know, I had an editor at the New York Times used to always say, you know, the, the, the biggest stories in the world, you know, you just got to tell it, tell it through the power of one. And that's the only way people will get it, to tell it through the power of one. So, to the extent you have a couple hours to kill sometime, look the series up. It's called Punched Out. Um, it's the power of one. And it invites, I think, some serious questions about the power of all of us. So, thanks. Um, I approached this a little bit differently than Joe did. I, I was uh, born on the last day of the 1969 baseball season, the year that the Cubs had the miraculous collapse to the New York Mets. My father called it the only bright day in an otherwise dismal year. Um, I learned to read by looking at the box scores of the Cubs with my grandfather. I am uh, just, as you can probably imagine, an eternal optimist. I think every year is the year that the curse gets broken. So to me, sport is a wonderful, fertile ground for so much human drama, for wonderful stories of success, of failure, of life, of death, um, of validation of struggle. And the stories I wanted to, I, I'll continue on, on Joe's theme of kind of focusing on the micro. And, and I don't sit here today, the fascinating kind of, uh, uh, of issue that I was coming up with is sport is usually about, is very black and white. There are wins and losses. There are personal records and, and, and there are, you can measure success in sport. And yet ethics, I think if we're being honest, there's some gray. And I wanted to take you back to a story that this campus was extremely familiar with, that being uh, University of Colorado in its national championship football season in the fifth down game at the University of Missouri. And I will, in full disclosure, tell you that my wife is an alum of the University of Missouri, and she and her brothers and her sister and their parents were in the end zone at the game and the story that I'm going to share with you that happened. Now, by all accounts, Faroe Field in Columbia, Missouri that day was in miserable shape. It was not a well cared for gridiron, if you will. And Colorado should have won that game by a lot. But coming down at the end, Missouri was ahead. And Colorado had the ball at two yard line, three yard line. And it ends up that they scored on a fifth down, which in football is not allowed. Now, there is there are records of people, players on that team saying, we, this is fifth down. And the coaches went ahead and carried on as if the game was being played. The referees had the fourth down signal on the sidelines. Now the referee, the head referee in Ishmael, I, this is fascinating because you'd, you'd be interested in this. A guy by the name of J.C. Loudenback, who at the time was one of the top referees in the Big Eight. And when I worked at Channel 9, we had an opportunity to go and interview him. And basically, this game changed his career, basically ended his professional career. And he lived with this years later, a mistake. But we're not here to talk about the mistake. We're here to talk about the ethics on the playing field of the people involved with that mistake. I don't sit here judging what happened that day, but I would ask, did the Colorado coaches, did the Colorado players have an ethical responsibility to not accept that victory? Could they have forfeited that game? Should they have forfeited that game? In today's day and age, it's real easy to look back and pass judgment. And I'm not sitting up here today, but what fascinates me about this is I have an eight and a half year old daughter who loves to swim competitively. I have a six and a half year old son who loves to play soccer and basketball competitively. I have a five-year-old daughter who loves to do gymnastics competitively. What am I teaching them? That if 
the officials on the field of play or if somebody breaks the rules and it's not caught, am I telling them that's okay? Ethically, that just doesn't square with how I'm trying to raise my children. There's a, a and this is a, a bit of a digression, but um, the Virginia Tech professor, Mark Edwards, who helped investigate the situation in Flint, Michigan with the uh, water contamination there, teaches an ethics class at Virginia Tech. And, and the way he frames it is we all have what's called aspirational ethics, and then there are situational ethics. And aspirational ethics are how we perceive ourselves at our best. The noblesse, if you will, that we all believe we would have. The tennis player who, even though the serve is called in, will say, no, that was out. That's what happens when you're in kind of pickup tennis, when you're playing not necessarily at the level of a competition. And interestingly enough, I thought, Joe, when you were talking about the stories, you were going to mention Maria Sharapova, the world's most um, compensated athlete, female athlete in the world, is on suspension right now. We don't even know for how long because she took a performance-enhancing drug. For the people who are on the field, and Bill Ishmael, you'll be able to speak to this directly because you, you at least saw this firsthand. But as a dad, I'm looking at this right now and I'm trying to figure out how my kids are gonna survive in this world. What do I tell them when somebody doesn't play by the rules and yet they're allowed to succeed in the field of play? I'll give you another example of a, of a book that I'm researching right now. Um, State of Louisiana in 1956 passes a law that uh, prohibits integrated sports activities. So African American athletes can't come into the state of Louisiana to play. This is the height of Jim Crow. Um, they had a home and home football series in 1957 and 1958 with the University of Wisconsin, which at the time had the first African American quarterback in the Big Ten, Big Ten Conference history, a gentleman by the name of Sidney Williams, who went to Little Rock Central High School of all places found a scholarship at the University of Wisconsin, played quarterback. They had an African-American wide receiver. They had African-American linemen. They had multiple African-Americans on that team. And within hours of Louisiana making this, passing this law and the governor signing it into law, University of Wisconsin cancels the contract. Now you say, what kind of a school, would we see that in today's day and age? Would we see a school pass on a potential major college or professional sports experience for their teams out of principle. And let me even add an extra layer to it. In 1958, Louisiana State University ends up being the number one ranked team in the country. The University of Wisconsin is ranked fourth with a tie. The players at Wisconsin, Mr. Williams still to this day believes they would have won that game. In essence, it's not too much of a stretch to say had they played that game and won that game, they would have been the national champions. They gave up a chance to play for the national championship. And no one regretted it, but they did so out of principle. These are the ethical kind of questions that I find myself faced with, is, is, and especially as a dad now who loves sports. I want my kids to win the right way. And I know that sounds aspirationally ethical. And my goal is that when they're in the field of play and the situation happens in front of them, they will be situationally ethical as well. And I don't sit here by any means, I, there are far more expert people on this panel today than this, but I, I just wanted to share with you my thought. And it's an issue that I think we see every single day. I mean, the performance enhancing drug scandal in Major League Baseball is extremely troubling. That people would sit by knowing that fellow teammates were cheating and let them get away with it. What kind of a message is that sending? Take aside the cheating impact of it itself. It's the people on the side who are watching this and allowing it to happen. That kind of situational ethics I have trouble with. Um, so I, again, I, this, is, this is more of a very gray topic for me as I'm trying to navigate parenthood, nothing that is more humbling uh, in my life. Every single day I find myself woefully unprepared for it. And this is one of those situations. I mean, what am I going to tell a kid? I, I, well, one of my kids, I don't know. I would hope that their aspirational and their situational ethics will overlap. But experience, I think we would all say, shows otherwise. I just hope my kids are more the anomaly rather than the rule. But thank you.
I'll go. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> thank you guys for having us here. Um, very humbled to be in front of you guys. And um, I said this yesterday. <laughs> uh, my wonderful host, uh, Brenda and Anor, told me not to iron my shirts because people here are very casual. <laughs> so <laughs> forgive that. Um, <laughs> and I had a run this morning looking at those mountains. I live in Austin, Texas with my wife and our two children, 10, ten years old and th three old boys. And we have flatlands. We don't have anything close to hills. So it's wonderful looking at the mountains. Um, with your permission, pr the perspective I'd like to share with you about the topic is that of um, a practitioner, one that's on the pitch. And um, I'm, Joe, I'm glad you mentioned the, 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 the example and, and the referee and the impact it has in his life. Every time I step out on the field, I know that this could be my last game. I'm not sure a lot of players carry that burden. A lot of referees carry that burden. But let's start on a brighter note. Uh, <laughs> talking about manifestation of ethics in sports, um, and you guys can share your perspective, Bill, also from just b being a flag director and, and, and you know, responsible for many sports and now in football. But in soccer, we have these wonderful moments that happen I want to say relatively often th there are moments of unspoken sportsmanship and grand ethics. I'll give you a couple examples. There are times where uh, a player gets injured and it's not a serious injury so the referee is not required to stop the game for that. They will wait for the next stoppage. The other team usually just kicks the ball out, right? And when the play is restarted with a throw-in, uh, the other team usually gives the ball back to the other team, and you get an applaud. A very warm moment in sports, but sometimes it manifested in a much greater impact, where in an attempt to give the ball back, they end up scoring on a team. <laughs> and you can YouTube it. You will see instances where a team would let the other team go score on them to get back level and then play on a level field. I find that fascinating as a moment of just ethics in sport, and uh, hopefully there are some other examples in other sports where they do that. So what I would like to share with you today is are, are two examples where there's conflicts between ethics, integrity, and the business of sports. The first one has to do with, we're not even going to touch FIFA scandal, we'll get to that later. <laughs> so the first one has to do with illegal gambling and how it impacts soccer here in America, and the second one will be around uh, the conflict of superstardom and the business of selling the game as an entertainment product and we as the referees and some of the other players having to play by a different standard that, com that conflicts with that. So in the first case, uh, in our league, believe it or not, because we play in a different schedule than the rest of the soccer uh, leagues in the world, we become the highest, most available betting league in the world. Tens of millions of dollars every weekend, sometimes millions of dollars on every game, where the players, some of the players are still making 60 grand a year. So put yourself in the shoes of a player from Costa Rica or Honduras when they're having lunch or shopping in the mall the day before the game and somebody comes and approaches them a picture and within five minutes they get to the point where you're telling them your family, your loved ones, we're going to go after them if we don't come to an agreement about what you're going to help us with. Or, here's $200,000. If you're from Honduras, you know how much that means. It will set you up and your family with private schooling and everything for a few years. And we have this happening today, and Joe probably can, can attest to some situations. We have referees as well that are targeted. We have some that are became victim of this as well. It starts very casual, and these guys are related to organized crime. So when they turn their nasty face, it gets very nasty very quick. So how do we combat that? How do we stop it? We're talking about people that are very powerful. Right? So these are some of the challenges that we see. Luckily, the, the leagues have so many layers of detection, prevention, training, 
et cetera, that will prevent these things. But the danger is so great when someone penetrates through those layers in little old sport here in the U.S. of soccer. But when you step out of the U.S., soccer is the number one sport in the world. And some of you might be familiar with the FIFA scandals that are in the hundreds of millions of dollars if you talk about the awarding of a World Cup, which means billions of dollars to the country that gets it. So we're not even <laughs> going to get to that. So let's go back to little old me. Um, to the second example. So when, let's take Major League Soccer, for example, a league that's trailing behind the NFL, baseball, and trying to catch up with, uh, trailing behind NFL, baseball, NBA, and trying to catch up with the NHL. And they get this major boost from a world star, David Beckham, who people have never seen a soccer game will still know who he is. And they fill stadiums because he's there. People go to their very first soccer match because he's there. And then put yourself in the shoes of the player from the other team that's about to injure him and get him out of the game. And the pressure he has on him. Does he have some conflict in mind about playing 100%? or not being the villain <laughs> that got Beckham out of the game. But more dear to me are the games when we had to throw him out of the game. And I did. And I know about some colleagues of mine that did. We lost sleep before the game and we lost sleep after the game. Because no one is there to watch me. Everybody's there to watch him. So f to us, those are examples of micro level challenges where the business and the money side of the sports trickles down all the way to the 90 minutes of running around the pitch. Some of it has to do obviously with the legal side and the gambling, some of them has to do with just how we apply laws. Could that tackle have been a yellow card, which is just a caution you don't get ejected, could that tackle have been a yellow card? Sure, I could give a yellow card. Most people won't blame me. But I know as a referee in my training that that's a red card tackle and he should be out because any other player would have been out. Do I still give it is my challenge. Mm -hmm. And what is that to you in your business, in your engagements? Are you faced with those? How do you deal with them? I would love for this conversation to take us there and for us to come to some common path. I wouldn't say solutions, but at least a path towards solutions to that. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Being up here with fellow parents, we all have that in similarity. We have two journalists, a referee, and if you're looking at what hat I wear in the sports world, it's probably been where the buck stops with the sports administrator at perhaps the national or international level. Being an athletic director, being chair of the athletic directors in the Big Ten, the biggest conference in the country, being president of the Olympics, president of the sport of sailing, all that stuff. Um, I look at it from the macro level. We heard stories from the personal micro level. I have to look at it from the macro level and when I deal with it, it's already filtered through the press. It's a delay and then a decision has to be made on ethical issues. I can tell you a survey that was done a couple of years ago by sports fans. What were the two biggest areas of concern that sports fans had in this country? Two things, you've mentioned one of them already. Performance enhancing drugs is one of them and player conduct is the other. Whether it's a professional athlete, a high school athlete, a college athlete. You see it all the time. We get disgusted with the behavior of athletes. I want to share with you one ethical instance that happened to me when I was in Colorado Springs as president of the Olympics. It was after the Sydney Olympic Games. We got a brown paper bag in the mail with two used uh, hypodermic needle cartridges. Nothing else. No word, no letter, no nothing. We sent those to th our drug laboratory at that time, which was at UCLA. 
it came back that that was a performance enhancing drug. Do you remember the name Belco, Bay Laboratory Laboratory? That was the start of the investigation. It started here in Colorado with a brown paper bag delivered to us. That investigation led to many professional athletes where it led to us in the Olympics and thanks to other sports journalists who really pursued this story and got an Olympic track star who ran for us in the Sydney Games in one of the relays to admit the, he, that he had been using these in performance enhancing drugs. So we found out about it. Now what do we do as a country? We had won that gold medal. What do we do and what is our objective in the Olympics? We want two uh, medals, two metrics to judge us e every four years. One, did we win total medals and did we win the most gold medals? Those are what we look at every time. And the press always tries to predict what we'll do and so forth. And by the way, we've done extremely well in the last two decades in the Olympics. And the only reason we've done it is because of Title IX and the performance of women athletes. They have carried the men in. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so what I did is I got in an airplane with our new executive director, because I'd fired the old one. We went to Lausanne, Switzerland, to the International Olympic Committee meeting and met with them and said we were dirty. And we returned the medal. They couldn't believe it. They absolutely couldn't believe it. They'd never had that experience before. So I would say we did the right thing aspirationally and the right thing that very day to do it. But, you know, that's what you have to do in life. Ethics is about doing the right thing when people aren't looking. And, you know, we try to practice it. I, I mean, these stories about head injuries and football, I'm on the board of the National Football Foundation. I'm on the board of the, the Miami Dolphins. Don't think for a minute, we're not scared like hell about moms. Because moms are gonna control the future of football in this country, and they should. And every step is being taken in that area to deal with it. But it's up to an individual decision whether somebody participates in a sport. And don't think for a moment that football is the only sport that has high risk to it. It's the one we talk about the most because it gets the most press. Two years ago, a national player on a Australian women's field hockey team got killed when the ball hit her in the chest. And if any of you played field hockey, you know how hard that ball is. We've had women playing third base or first base in softball have very serious injuries. You all know if you watch softball, that's a dangerous situation when they charge the hitter thinking it's gonna be a bunt and it's a line drive right into their face. So sports has challenges and you just have to face it in life. It's an individual decision as to what you do. But the two major issues I think that transmit all sports are performance enhancing drugs and the player conduct. I can say at the NCAA level, what, what is the purpose of the NCA? It's to make certain, number one, there's a level playing field. Everybody operates under the same rules. The second one is to ensure student welfare and make certain that we put the student athletes first, that we don't put them in those situations where they can have serious problems. The challenges in football are the field is the same size, but the guys that play it are bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. Somebody once said the way to get rid of the injuries in football is take the helmets off. Think about it. You wouldn't use your head as a battering ram anymore, would you? Think of the comparison with rugby, where they don't wear anything, and you don't see anywhere near the same number of injuries. Well, why is that? Because the only way you can tackle somebody is to bear hug them. It, it's very interesting. We could get to that point. But ultimately, it's up to the fans. If the fans don't like it, they're gonna walk away. They're not gonna support the sport. And we'll see significant change. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there. I got a lot more I could say, but I, I wanna hear what all these questions are gonna be. Okay, uh, 
I'm going to reread the question, the way to submit a question by text, and then well, if you have, if you guys have some questions for each other or some some points you want to add before I do that, and then we'll take the questions from the audience. I, I'm happy to. Okay. I'm going to go two for two then, because now I'm going to piss Bill off. Um, but I, 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 his his ranking of the ethical issues of significance, performance enhancing drugs, and player conduct. I, I didn't rank them. That's what I said. Fans are most right, and I think them. that's where I'm most culpable is having played a role in uh, in the media of having somehow suggested to the public that those are really the most significant things you need to be worried about because they are not, uh, and by a long shot. You know the the entire war on uh, performance enhancing drugs is, you know, uh, mirrors almost exactly the fruitless, ridiculous waste of money that the war on drugs has been in America. Um, it's ineffective. It's uh, uh, intellectually dishonest, um, and it's punishing people for their own individual. Uh, decisions all in the name of some uh, uh, unachievable and un, um, an incredible uh, set of you know uh, honor and uh, you know what are legitimate records and what are illegitimate records and uh, you know and player conduct uh, uh, again to me whether you know I mean. Having been a sports writer, I, I've grown fond of saying that it, it kills the fan in you. Um, and it does um, because a lot of these guys and gals you wind up covering are just simply not that interesting, not that smart. Um, uh, but, and so the idea that they will misbehave, that they will, you know, uh, uh, you know, engage in, uh, unethical or criminal conduct. Uh, welcome to America. I I I, I don't hold any uh, rational expectation that athletes <laughs> will outperform the general public in those regards. Um, you know, at the risk of just being going of going all here, right? I mean, to me, <laughs> the real ethical issues are places like the University of Michigan um, and the NCAA. And you know, people who want to give voice to concern about the student athlete, and uh, you know, really, can we stop? Can we please stop with the student athlete? Um, th they don't exist, uh, not at that level. Um, and we want to, you know, care about their conduct, but God forbid we should actually pay them. Um, you know, we want them to make us a fortune, but we don't intend to share with them. Uh, that and if they give their bodies up to it, and you know, take take Nick Saban's University of Alabama football team from three years ago, when they have some obscene number of players, you know, who can Bill will know this better than me, and I, you know, I don't know how many ninety-five scholarship athletes you can have on a football team, some incredible number, um, which is all just a big giant game of human physical attrition. So some number of them will be maimed and and sent off, and some number of them will be damaged in other ways, and some number of them will fail out of school, some number of them will have their scholarships taken away because, geez, you know, we got a guy who's a little bit fitter than you at this point, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll honor our, our obligation to you up to a point. Um, but, you know, and take a look at those 95 people four years later, those 95 guys, what became of them? How well were they served by their university? How much did they contribute to the, to the financial welfare of that university and how much did they benefit from it. It's not going to be a pretty picture. Um, you know, it's, it, uh, you, uh, this may be so well known as to, you know, be encouraging to do something you, you did years ago or whatever, but um, the Atlantic Magazine, I guess four or five years ago, um, invited Taylor Branch, historian, um, uh, biographer to take a look at the NCAA. He wrote a 25,000 word piece for the Atlantic. And for many people, Bill, myself, others who have been steeped in, uh, in that world, some of it was not that revelatory. But for the outsiders, for maybe 
three quarters of the people sitting in this audience, whatever. It's a bracing, dispiriting, honest, troubling, provocative read. Um, and you can Google it. Taylor Branch, NCAA, Atlantic Magazine. It'll give you, I think, a good, you know, foundational uh, 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 framework for if we really want to talk about where the ethical issues are um, in athletics today, sports today, at least by my light, which is just one light. Um, it's not performance enhancing drugs and it's not player conduct. I, I will disagree, but in the interest in keeping this moving <laughs> forward and hearing questions, I'll shut up. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna just go back through real quick how you ask questions. I have a number of questions that have come in, but we want to text to this number, 222233, and this is the text of your message, M UMC GMB, and they will invite you in, you'll get a confirmation, and you just reply to that with your question. I have to tell you that some of the questions as they get long, are getting cut off and I'm not getting, it's not opening up for me so I can see the end of it. So. Oh, it says the text is full. Well, that shouldn't be because I, I don't have that many questions. So, um, you know, I guess if that's the case, uh, yeah. We, we have the mic here. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll maybe start with some of these texted questions because I have some from students, but, um, you know, we can do it the old fashioned way. You can either, get a, a three by five card. Do we have any three by five cards filled out? Yeah, if you can bring me those, they can hand you those or we can you know, start to develop a line up here. Again, if you're a student, please uh, mark that on your text or on your three by five card. Um, so some of, some of the questions have started to be addressed, but um, uh, one of them was one that, that Joe started to, uh, to address right there, which is the question of NCAA payment of student athletes, if you can comment on that. I'll be happy to, because I did a TV interview with a local channel on that subject this very morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Along with uh, Rick George, the athletic director of this university. And both of us believe we should not pay college athletes. Keep in mind one thing. There's three divisions of college athletes, right? Division one, two, and three. And when people talk about paying athletes, what's in their mind? They're talking about paying those athletes that generate revenue, which is essentially football and basketball, and in some schools, hockey also, generating surplus revenue, more than the cost of operating that sport, including scholarships, medical, uh, transportation, et cetera. What takes place if you look at it this way? Assume for a moment that we did pay football and basketball players. You're all familiar with Title IX. There would be Title IX litigation coming into every college campus that paid athletes because we're not providing equal treatment to all sports and all gender athletes. So number one, it's kind of a non-starter for legal reasons. Right now, the Ed O'Bannon case, Ed was the a uh, UCLA basketball player that sued the NCAA saying you should pay us in essence. That case is being reviewed right now by the Supreme Court and it will decide whether it will even hear it and take issue with the Ninth District Court I think of California on that case which found for the NCAA. And what the court said is you can pay student athletes as long as it's related to their cost of education. So where are we today? Today, all full scholarship athletes, not the non-scholarship athletes, get the cost of education, they get an additional supplemental allowance here in the case of Colorado, it's $2,200 per year, and they get in, uh, medical care, they get books, they get room and board, and some of the newest innovations that come along that I think are tremendous, and they weren't in the NCAA system when I was an athletic director a couple of years ago, but they are now, probably as a result of this effort to provide uh, further benefits for athletes. And this goes to all of them. Let's say an athlete, after two years, tries to have a pro career. 
and he washes out in one or two years. We will now take that athlete back and cover all his costs to complete his degree. That's a huge, huge benefit. Look on the other hand, let's say we were to pay athletes $100,000 a year, all right? Like all the rest of us, he has to pay taxes, right? So 30, 35%, now he's down to around $65,000 a year. And if he wants to attend college, now he's gotta pay tuition, right? It doesn't add up. They're probably have, getting a far better financial benefit during their four years by being under the current system. Furthermore, we would just change the dynamics within the academic culture around colleges. You would have the haves and the have nots. And I don't think there's anybody involved today in the NCA, and the NCA isn't a perfect institution. I'll be the first one to say that. I, I've said for years they're barnacled, encrusted, slow to react, and it's, you know, it is what the college presidents wanted. Because who runs the NCAA? The college presidents, they make up the board of directors, they select one of their own to be president, and if you wanna get changes in college sports, you gotta go talk to your presidents. So that's my perspective on paying college athletes. One quick note on that lawsuit too though, um, he had sued also EA Sports, the, the game maker, and they settled. Um, and I think that's a different dynamic. So the, they were using the likeness of college players in the video game. They ended up settling and not going to court. But that's right. That Thanks. part was, was adjudicated, it was settled out of court. Well, one th a question that's related to, to the, well, only related in the sense that it's a, it, you mentioned the, uh, the gender disparity. A question came in of um, what do you think of the recent federal claims of wage discrimination that the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team filed? Yeah. Everybody looks to you as male. <laughs> um, <coughs> so um, it, it's something that all of us that are close to those circles have been talking about. Um, the men's national team went through their struggles to get what they thought was fair pay as well. Um, obviously, the women's team, for, for you guys that don't know, are the world champions. They, they do, give them a round of applause. <laughs> um, Title IX. Title IX, thank you, there you go. Um, they are also, in, in, in most situations, bringing equal if not more revenue than the men's team in most situations, not all. So um, if you're asking me about my personal opinion as a person that's in those circles, I think the gap should be closed. I think both sides will bring their math of why the numbers are where they are. Um, my hope is that the gap now, which is very wide, will close. The, uh, just to return to, to uh, Bill's point, and it's, you know, it's consistent. I mean, it, the, to me, it's not a, an issue of uh, whether or not, you know, you formally pay athletes. You know, we can, you know, there are many, Joe Nocera mounted an argument uh, to pay athletes, student, uh, college athletes, um, you know, in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, and it had some merits and some shortcomings, and you know, you can argue them off the table. The, to me, the, the question is, when are, you, when are people gonna be prepared to just address and find a way to address the question of equity? That, so it can be paying them or not, but the idea, and I hate to be so cynical, um, but I mean, the idea that their benefit is this college education that they're getting, and that, and that's somehow a, you know, two hundred thousand dollar gift we're giving them, uh, in re in in recompense for their uh, athletic efforts and uh, the price their bodies will pay. Uh, it's 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 just not a sustainable argument. I mean, you know, uh, again, and the gift that just doesn't stop giving, right? The the NCAA game last night or the Final Four. Uh, two of the schools in the Final Four, North Carolina and Syracuse, 
are only the most recent institutions to have made a complete sham of the idea of, of student education. North Carolina has had to concede that its athletes haven't been going to classes for ages. They invent classes, they invent grades. I mean, it's, uh, I almost can't even work up anger anymore. I've become so conditioned to it. Syracuse University, their coach sat out half the season because his program was found to have been faking grades and worse. Um, so the idea that you can sell a kid on the idea, you're gonna get this 200, th first the scandal of college, college education costs to begin with. I mean, that's where the, talk about ethical lapses. Uh, you know. Um, but the idea that this, is, this amounts to an equitable treatment of your kids it's, 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 it's just not honest. But if you're looking, Joe, at the, I mean, we're, Bill mentioned that we're talking about the couple of revenue generating sports here. You know, if you are a women's hockey player at the University of Wisconsin, or you're a swimmer at the University of Michigan, or you're a, um, I'm trying to think of a non-revenue sport here at the University of Colorado, the benefit of a four-year education along with the opportunity to play competitive college sports is different. Uh, and, and I think you would find collectively with that population, they would find the idea of what they're getting in exchange for what they're giving to be a fair trade. Now in the eyes of, of kind of these revenue generating sports, I mean, the amount of money in the NCAA in the Final Four last night is ungodly. I mean, it, it's, it's enormous amount of money. And at, I, I went to the University of Michigan and my alma mater, the, the, the Fab Five, is the famous story of, of five freshman players who made that university a ton of money. They sold a ton of jerseys with Chris Webber's number on it, with Jalen Rose's number on it. Now, was that fair to them? I think that's a very legitimate question to pursue. But for the women's hockey player, maybe at Michigan, I'm trying to think, of what's a non-revenue sport there, Bill? That, that's field hockey. A field hockey player there is... Do they require, do they need payment, do you think, to, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't know this. So I'm, I'm just saying, do they need payment in right. order to make well, this Well, this would fair? be my first rejoinder to that, which is two things are noteworthy uh, about that. One, I'd love to have that proposition truth tested yeah. um, to see whether what we would accept as a, and I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong, and I'm not saying it's untrue. I'd love to see it truth tested because it never has been. The idea that the, the gal who emerges from uh, the college hockey team feels like she's gotten, given all uh, that she's contributed to that and all the time she had to put in to, to play at that level, whether she's gotten the kind of education that she thinks uh, is, is, is a fair value for what she's given. So I'd love to see that tested. But two, you're gonna rather quickly, right, start to say, so what's different about the revenue generating sports and how we deal with them and the non-revenue generating sports where they might get a better academic deal. Well, one is you're gonna find a real racial distinction there, right? That those college hockey teams, those women's college hockey teams, the lacrosse teams, whatever, they're white, almost exclusively. And the revenue generating teams are predominantly African American, Latino. Uh, so again, it's, it's just another thing to ponder why it breaks down that way. Um, and why we think that, you know, it's okay to, or maybe okay to uh, countenance treating college athletes this way, uh, uh, you know, if they're black and playing football, um, as long as we're treating the white hockey player girls okay. I just pause for thought. L let me make one final comment on this, and uh, we don't want to beat this to death but we've been implying in this entire discussion that the football and basketball teams at these schools all raise revenue. What about Division II and Division III where there is no revenue whatsoever that comes in? You still see the kids playing football, basketball. So, I, you know, you're talking about a microcosm of school. We call it the Power Five conferences, the Big Ten, the SEC the Pac-12 and so forth and so on. Those are the only conferences and those are a small fraction of the number of kids in this country that play all sports. There are over 800 schools in this country alone that play college football and that number, surprising, surprising to me, 
frankly, has grown in the last couple of years. Not a lot, a couple each year. So the revenue only applies to those Power Five conference schools. And how many is that? Not very many, 70 or 80 out of you know 800 schools with football teams. It's amazing. Great, thanks. We have a student question that in response to Mr. Elfath's point about how athlete superstardom has affected ethics and spoink, sports, can you comment on the seeming invincibility of professional and college athletes in cases of sexual assault? I'd like to, others to comment as well. Um, <laughs> so, um, the only interesting thing about those, for me, it's my personal opinion, the only interesting thing about those situations when they arise, because they're happening around us every single day, right? The only interesting thing is that now this player is famous, right? I go back to what Bill thought or shared, survey I believe, as player conduct being one of the top concerns. For me, it's a culture that starts from the youth levels, that it's okay to get away with a little bit if you're gonna help the team win. I refereed and their six year old, and they're 10, high school, middle school, college, all the way up, and I've seen it at every single level. From the coaches, from the parents, from the referees. If it's the guy that the team is not even gonna play close to competitively if he's not there, and he has the wrong socks, we're under pressure, and usually we succumb to it, we're gonna let him play. That trickles its way up through the levels to these higher and more public and more egregious acts is the culture of it's okay to get a little bit to get away with a little bit if you are that important to the team it is sad we should all be combating it if your kid is one of those kids tell them it's not okay if you're the coach tell them it's not okay if uh, me as a, as a referee when i go mentor etc that's one of the things that we're trying to drive is grassroot level ethics in sports. But just a little quick math, right? And, I, and again, I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful to Bill or a complete antagonist, but so 70 or 80 uh, power schools or whatever, if you do the math, right, many of them are big state schools. How many undergrads here at Colorado? 30,000, okay, and you could probably do similar math at Michigan and Nebraska and, you know, so I, quick thing, 80 times 25,000, whatever, that's two million students. So the fortunes of one way or the other or the decisions being made on college campuses involving two million kids or whatever are in many ways influenced to some degree or not by the big business of college athletics. So that doesn't seem like a, small number of fates and fortunes to be worrying about. <laughs> let's go on. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, we have uh, one that takes us a little different direction, draft kings, legal or not is the question and I guess, uh, I guess from our point of view, ethical or not would be another question. Adam, you wanna? Start that off since you kind of. A game of skill versus a game of chance. I, I'm not a lawyer. I uh, don't play one on TV. Um, I do play fantasy sports, uh, not daily fantasy sports, but that's the question that's being asked now. Um, there's a great frontline documentary about uh, daily fantasy sports and the challenges associated with kind of regulating it and, frankly, the business of um, the major power teams in the NFL. The, uh, uh, Bob Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots, Jerry Jones, uh, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys. I forgot which ones. They're, they're either investors in DraftKings or FanDuel. Does anybody? They're, they're investors in one of them. And, and in baseball, uh, when you watch uh, somebody at the Los Angeles Dodgers Stadium uh, warm up in the bullpen, I, I believe it's either DraftKings or FanDuel there. They, you couldn't watch television over the last six months without seeing a commercial for DraftKings or FanDuel. Um, it's going to be a very interesting conversation as states in New York, uh, a number of other states, Nevada, 
uh, Illinois are looking at right now um, whether or not they're going to forbid these companies from um, taking bets, if you will, uh, I I from these companies. And the Frontline documentary, interestingly, Ishmael kind of looked at soccer and some other kind of sports that uh, in this country we might not necessarily be betting on a lot on a daily fantasy sports level, but it's growing worldwide. And there are connections in the Frontline documentary that they proved to organize crime as well. Not those two companies. I'm not insinuating that. But there was an interesting documentary. The, uh, I mean, I do think that, uh, for me, it's not a hard call, uh, you know, games of skill, games of chance. It's a false distinction, whatever. Um, it's all gambling, um, and it should all be legal. Uh, I have no problem with legalized gambling, uh, uh, spoken in part because I'm a degenerate uh, horse player, um, so I love nothing more than going to the track. Um, and, you know, so the idea that, well, it's a game of skill because I spent a little time figuring out whether this tight end was going to play more minutes and this guy, uh, as if that's meaningfully, di you know, different or any more likely to produce a good outcome than me looking at, you know, uh, you know, Red Hot Mama in the th in the seventh race. Well, she ran seven furlongs three weeks ago, and I think you know she can be she can bounce back. Look at her speed figures, whatever. I mean, it's all you know, it's all gambling, and and I think uh, and this is people who know me well would drop dead. But I'm going to praise a, a a sports commissioner, or whatever. I think Adam Silver, uh, who I like quite a bit, um, and who seems like one of the few adults to step up and say. You know, we should we should legalize gambling on sports. Um, we should do it above board and 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 regulate and manage it the way uh, gambling is otherwise managed in America. Uh, and you know that if you want to reassure yourself about um, what's going on and what's real and what isn't and uh, the integrity of the game, then be as transparent as possible. Bring it on. I support that entirely. We have several questions that go to this question of, of danger in the NFL and actually in other sports too. One of them was, uh, do you think that the MLS and FIFA are, are gonna be the next ones to be dealing with this concussion issue? But, um, so we could get into that. And, and then uh, one of the question, a couple of the questions are, what's your prediction for American football 15 years from now? Mine will be short, so I'll start. Okay. And then you can deal with the concussions at the NFL level. Um, so um, <coughs> concussions are a serious is issue in soccer as well. Um, uh, the, the number of occurrences is, is much less in a soccer match than it would be in, in a football match. But when they do happen, um, they are serious. And for players that play certain positions in a soccer field, either the center backs or the forwards, and, and some keepers are far more uh, at danger of concussions than the rest of the players that are usually uh, playing with the ball at their feet. Um, <laughs> in the soccer circles, there's this theory, Bill, you tell me if it's right or not, that soccer is taking over at the youth levels, and it is, and the surveys and stats show it, it's, it's the number one sport for youth, is because it's looked at as relatively safer than football, it's looked at as faster than baseball, <laughs> and it's looked at as cheaper than basketball. <laughs> so um, so it's, it's, it's catching a lot of traction. However, we do have players that are notable, that are uh, ESPN analysts now, et cetera, that had to retire early because of concussions, all right? So in Major League Soccer, one of our major steps during preseason is concussion training and concussion early detection. It, everybody goes through it, the coaches, the players, the obviously the doctors and, and uh, the referees. Our responsibility is to stop the, the game immediately if we have any sign of a head injury, right? Regardless of what's going on and, and beckon the, uh, the medical staff on. Um, U.S. Soccer has released, uh, I want to say about six months ago, a, call it a directive, it's not required yet, that had some suggested ages, minimum ages for bef before which a youth player cannot head the ball at all. It's never gonna happen, I can tell you that, but they are being proactive, and it when if, if and when it becomes enforced, I personally don't see it ever becoming enforced because um, we have the rest of the world to compete with and they're not gonna do that. Um, then it's probably one step forward uh, of them trying to be proactive. But uh, it is an issue, it is an issue that uh, 
we all are should be concerned about and um, in the soccer world hopefully it's not a major issue as football so bill um what are you going to do about it are you going to outlaw it or not are you going to ban it headers or not no no so you're going to live with it w well if you if you phrase it like that living with something that means it's really really bad so right. in, in <laughs> soccer it's not really really bad right. compared to football so I mean, I, I would love to think that, uh, you know, football would be dead in, in 10 years. And a couple of years ago, I at least briefly entertained the fantasy of that. Um, but that would actually, so what would that require? That would require a huge multi-billion dollar business to give up. Or it would require Americans en masse to actually behave responsibly. Um, so I'm a little pessimistic uh, about it, but part of what, um, you, you know, we'll, we'll, one of the real menaces to keeping it going is that the financial incentives, um, you know, Bill talked earlier about that it's an individual choice whether you want to play this game. Kind of, but when you set before people a set of financial incentives that pervert their ability to make a responsible or a fully responsible judgment about their best interests, then in some ways it's not up to an individual choice. And in football, you know, which is so heavily dominated by African American athletes, uh, if there is a financial incentive that says, you know, you can make millions of dollars doing this and you have, you know, an African-American American population who, you know, uh, demographically look at them who have a financial need that's beyond others um, and thus an incentive to say yes, even in the face of, uh, of personal peril. Um, you know that's that's where the <laughs> that's where the ethics uh, meet the road. I, I don't think it's in those circumstances a free choice. I mean, uh, you know, it's a it's a somewhat outlandish parallel, but it it has some um, merit. Right? The Supreme Court a couple years ago um, said that you can no longer have uh, uh, you can no longer use the threat of a death penalty to win a a plea bargain um, because the the the, the, the risk of, uh, you know, death, if you went to trial or whatever, is so great, so enormous, that it, it doesn't actually allow for a free choice to be made by a defendant. So you may well be innocent, you may well want to go to trial, but if that is the potential threat of losing, that that creates an unfair decision uh, for a defendant to make. And I think, again, you can make a sort of a parallel. If you remain a set of such outsized incentives that people can make millions and millions of dollars if they are willing to put their physical welfare at risk, is that a fair decision that they're being asked to make? Just one little follow-up on that. Um, I got grandsons, three, five, and eight, they run around with footballs. It's a part of their DNA. I, none of them had said, Grandpa, if I'm really good at football one day, will I make five million bucks a year? I haven't heard that from any of them. It's a game kids love to play. They play it, and natural selection over time determines whether they play it at the professional level or not. You know, it's, and again, I, I agree with you earlier in what you said. It, I think moms are going to determine that whole question as to whether a kid plays or not. And I think that's where that decision should be made. <clears throat> and I don't think it should be made on an economic basis. Great. I think we are just about out of time. Does anybody have any, any final word? Unfortunately, we, ha we still have a few good questions, but... Uh, um, I don't. I don't know that we have time for any more. So, anything else? Well done. Thank you so much. It was a Thank great you. panel. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, sir. See you soon. Yeah.
faces. 